Beijing or Jiuzhou, uh tomorrow at 7 p.m. near the hotel. And I have another announcement. We have the IFT colloquium today, and it will be given by Professor Jim Sethna. So please come. It's 2 p.m. It's earlier, so we have a shorter time for lunch break. Just one hour, but it's 2 p.m. Jim Sethna is going to give the colloquium. So now we have uh, the third lecture by Pierre Francesco. Please go ahead. The, the microphone, maybe. So the idea for today is to try to build up the formalism to solve this perceptron model. But before doing that, I wanted just to mention uh, uh, something because, so the title of the lectures is high dimensional models for jamming transitions with the two S. And uh, I wanted to comment a bit on this because up to now we considered our spheres or spheres in general. But of course you can consider different kind of uh, particles, for example, ellipses, uh, ellipsoids. Uh, and I just wanted to say that uh, one can have the same abstract approach that we use to model uh, spheres, also to model different uh, types of uh, particles. For example, so I just wanted to discuss two generalizations. So the first one is uh, about ellipses or ellipsoids. So, so in this case, you have like particles that have this shape. And so in principle, uh, you need to take into account not only the position of the center of the particle, but also the angle. So you have xi and theta i. And so one way to think about this problem is to say, OK, I have exactly the same thing as before, but now my, degree, uh, my particles have some internal degree of freedom that is just the angle. And so uh, if you think this way, uh, the internal degrees of freedom can be, you can change their nature. So here in this realistic system is just the angle, but you can cook up an abstract model in which you put by hand some internal degree of freedom. And so let me discuss a perceptron for this. So how do you do? So, so yesterday we just said, OK, we have the, the usual perceptron. So we have a bunch of random vectors times this vector that is the degrees of freedom that corresponds to the position of the spheres. And then we subtract something, which, is, which plays the role of the sum of the radii. And then this is a gap. This is a gap variable. And then we want this to be positive. OK, and here we need to put some normalization factor in order to have something that is of order 1. Now, so one thing that one can do is to include some additional degrees of freedom here that play the same role as this theta i. And one way to do it is to add here. So it's first to consider a set of additional degrees of freedom. So let me call them b. So I have a vector. Now this vector is m-dimensional. So you have b1, bm. 
And now I would like to, to have this vector to be on a kind of compact space in order to avoid any crazy thing. So here it's a compact space, so I will put a compact space also here. So as before, I just consider this vector to be spherical. And then what I can do is that I can define a new gap in which here I add a term that depends on these degrees of freedom that I call internal degrees of freedom. And now you can think about this constant, this delta, as kind of the asphericity of the ellipsis. So if delta is equal to zero, I get back the original model, that is a model for spheres. But then as soon as delta is bigger than, than zero, then this plays the role of putting some asphericity in the original model. So, so again, for delta, equal to zero, we have the pure perceptron. That gives rise to the same physics as spheres. And for delta positive, we, I call it this polydispersed perce perceptron. And this corresponds, this, uh, this has the same physics as ellipses, meaning that when you look at the jamming transition in this case, you get the same physics as the one that you observe for ellipses. So I will not discuss this uh, in detail. And so this was, so we wrote a, a, a paper with Carolina Arukuni Keda. Uh, myself, Matteo Iar, and Francesco Zamponi. It's over 2018, I think. Where we, uh, where we discuss this model and we do a scaling theory for the jamming transition in ellipses. And this model is perfectly fine to, to describe the, the jamming physics of ellipses. And everything is inside the fact that, I mean, you have this idea that you have some internal degrees of freedom that, that you need to include in your, uh, in your model. OK. So this model is, is interesting and uh, can be used also to model this. So the other generalization that I wanted to discuss is on tissues. So there has been a lot of uh, uh, interest in, in the last years to, um, to model uh, uh, confluent tissues. And this was uh, done a lot by the group of Lisa Manning. Uh, so the idea is that you would like to understand the, the properties of um, two-dimensional tissues. So how do you model a tissue? Well, this is just a tessellation of the plane. So cells tessellate the plane. And the simplest way to construct a tessellation of the plane is that, is that you throw at random the points in the plane, and then you construct the Voronoi diagram. So there are other models for uh, confluent tissues, but this one is, uh, is simple because you have an idea of, of what is the center of the cell, which is the point that you choose in the plane, and then the boundary of the cell is just the edges of the Voronoi uh, diagram. And so in order to model the physics of the tissues, so what they propose is that you consider some cost function, some Hamiltonian. Uh, in which 
you put the contribution of each cell, and each cell, what it's trying to, to do is to optimize the perimeter and the area. Okay, so each cell has a target perimeter and a target area. And so the Hamiltonian, you can write a simple one, which is a sum over all the cells. And then you say that the area of the cell I needs to be close to some target area, A0, square. And then the perimeter of the cell I must be close to the target perimeter. Now, since you have a tessellation, actually this A0 is just fixed by the geometry. So this A0 is just the total volume of your box or, 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 or your plane divided by the number of cells. So the real control parameter here is P0, which essentially controls the shape of, um, of the cells. So if you allow P0 to be large, this means that you are allowing the cells to have shapes that are like this. Because in this case, you can keep your target area to have the desired value, but you, can, you have a lot of freedom to have a large perimeter. But of course, if you take your perimeter that is too small, and in particular it's smaller than, the, than a circle, then you cannot, I mean, you cannot have a low energy in this case just because the system is kind of frustrated. And so what they've done is that they studied this model as a function of P0. And then they show that, for example, in 3D, so in three dimension, and this is a paper by Merkel and Manning, You can have a transition, so there is a critical value of P0, such that above this critical value, the system is floppy. So it's liquid, floppy. And, then, and I say that it's SAT, in the sense that you can find an arrangement of the centers of the cells such that this total energy is zero. So each cell attains its target area and perimeter. And then there is a phase that is solid. It's typically glassy. Oops. And I say it's on SAT. Um, which means that you cannot find an arrangement of the cells that is able to match uh, target area and perimeter. Now, how do you make a model for this? So you see that here you have, I mean, this phase diagram is a phase diagram for a constraint satisfaction problem, again where you have equalities now, because you would like just that AI is equal to A0 for all cells, and PI is equal to P0. So you don't have inequalities, but you just have equalities. And the functions that you would like to put in the equalities are nonlinear functions. Just because, I mean, the area of a cell as a function of the neighbors of the centers of the neighboring cells is some kind of nonlinear function of, of the coordinates, and same as the perimeter. So one way to model this is to say, OK, so I have some functions. So let me just take again this ab abstract point of view, and then I consider h that is 1 half. So I put some constraints, a certain number of constraints. And then I say that I have some function, h mu, that I would like to take as a nonlinear function now. 
minus some target value square. And then now as a function here, what I choose is something which is uh, more than linear. So the simplest thing that you can do is that you can write something like this. And those are my degrees of freedom. And again, in order to have some compact phase space, I choose I choose this, this normalization. So I have a bunch of nonlinear functions that I would like to meet some constraint. The list of perceptions listed is the TC model. Yes. So this model actually was, OK, so, so the model is, um, can be solved exactly. Actually, it's much, it's much easier than the perceptron for some reason. Uh, and, um, and yeah, it has, I mean, it has a transition, a zero temperature transition from a floppy phase that is sat in which all those constraints are satisfied. And then you have a solid phase in which you are not able to satisfy all, all of them. So I mean, this way of thinking in a kind of abstract way, I, I like it because mm, it's simple and it, I mean, it, it gives you a way to, to, to take a step back from the microscopic problem and to think about it in a more general way. OK, so this is in a, in a preprint this year. So note that if I take this thing to be linear, then this problem becomes convex. So you have still a transition, but this phase is not glassy at all. It just has a unit global minimum. So in order to have some glassiness, non-convexity in this, in this region, and even approaching this, this point, you need to have something which is uh, nonlinear. Yes, it's just a one yes. You said that A does not change much. Uh, you mean, if we if, if would put a new line in the Y direction, bearing A0 as a parameter. Ah, you would like to vary A0. Yeah, just that you would, you would have a, a, a transition line that would be like, a, you, you would keep having like a, a, a gas transition line mm -hmm. from downsat to sat. Yes. But downsat would be just smaller while you have a. So what you can do is that you can show that this A0 actually is irrelevant here. In, ah. Is irrelevant in the sense that, so, this model is defined in such a way that your cells tessellate the plane. And since they tessellate the plane, you know that sum over i, ai, must be equal to n times a0. Well, but, but you could have a uh, polydispersity, right? You could say if cell were to have a different size. So I would put polydispersity in p0. So I would say, for example, that one cell would like to attain some target perimeter and another, and another one, another one. So, so for me, a zero is kind of a term that puts some tension in the system, but um, it's kind of fixed by the confluency condition. Okay. Does okay. not change the physics. It does not change the physics. So it changes in the sense that, for example, you can play the game in two dimension. In two dimension, you can show that this point is not there. So you cannot have a transition from a floppy phase to a solid phase if you have this term. Just because the number of constraints that you have is equal to the number of degrees of freedom always. So you cannot have a transition. But if you remove this term, the model is still well defined. So you, can have, you have cells. Now the cost function does not depend on the area. And you have a number of constraints that is less than the number of degrees of freedom. So you can have a transition from a floppy phase to a solid phase. In 2D, also. In, also in 2D. So the simplest thing for me is 3D just because, I mean, the most general thing that you can do is to add this term. But if you would like to have a model even in 2D, which has a transition, you just remove this term, and this Hamiltonian makes the job. So just by tuning P0, you get a transition. 
So what they've done, uh, so Lisa Manning and, and collaborators, is that they studied this and they put also activity because, you know, cells try to move. And then you try to study this system when you put some active forces on, on the centers. And this is a very active field of research. OK, so these are just the two generalizations that I wanted to discuss. Uh, and so what I would like to do now is to come back to the original model and tell you how one can solve it. And all the techniques that you can use to solve the original model, you can apply also to those models. OK. So I will just focus on the original one. OK, so let me start again with the perceptron. So, OK, so let me write again um, the expression for the gap. So you have this variable w that is on the sphere. OK, so you are on the n-dimensional sphere. And then you have a bunch of random vectors whose components are Gaussian random variables with zero mean and unit variance. And then you have this sigma that plays the role of the sum, sum of the radii in the context of uh, spheres. And how many of these gaps you have? So you have that mu goes from 1 to m, that is the number of constraints. And I consider the number of constraints that scales like alpha times n. OK. So the idea is try to find a configuration for this vector such that all those gap variables are positive, or at least equal to 0. So let me write a phase diagram. So here I put alpha as a control parameter, and here I put sigma. So what you expect is that if alpha is small, I have few constraints. And so typically, I will be able to satisfy uh, all those constraints since the dimension of, of the vector w is large. So you expect that in this region here, the problem is sub. OK. Now, if I fix sigma and then I start to increase alpha, I increase a lot the constraints. And so this means that at some point, I will not be able to satisfy all of them at the same time. So for large alpha, I expect to have an unsat phase. OK. And so you expect that there is a line that separates the two phases. That is a jamming transition line. OK, so in this region here, if I compute the Hamiltonian, so I can define an Hamiltonian h that is the sum over all the constraints of some cost function. And just for simplicity, let me consider v that is the harmonic one. So in this region here, h is equal to 0. Because I can find an assignment in which all of these variables are positive. And here h is positive. OK, so, so how can we study this problem? How can we compute, for example, this line? So the simplest thing is to start with some thermodynamic computation, which is, so let me define a partition function that is an integral over the phase space. of some Boltzmann factor. So 
So this Hamiltonian depends on quench disorder because all those gaps depend on these random vectors. And so this Gibbs measure is a random measure because it depends on some quench disorder that you have to give me in order to define it. Now, depending on where you are in this phase diagram, this partition function means different things. So let me consider the sub phase, where I know that at zero temperature, I will have the energy to be equal to zero. So in this case, if I look at this term, so for in the zero temperature limit, this just becomes a product over all the gaps of theta of h mu, right? Because if the temperature is going to zero, if I have a negative gap, this will give me an infinite. So this will be infinite, and this will go to zero. So this measure con concentrates only on the regions where the gaps are positive. So in the sub phase, z is just giving you the volume of solutions of your constraint satisfaction problem. Do you agree? And since you are in n dimension, the volume of an n dimensional object scales exponentially with the, the dimension. So you expect that this z scales exponentially with n, right? And so what it makes sense is to define a free energy. So let me define it here. Now I put the minus sign that I think I forgot yesterday, but it's no problem. So this will give me essentially the entropy of solutions per particle. Because if I take the log, I get S, which is the entropy the intensive entropy of the space of solutions. Yes? Is that beta going to zero? No, beta going to infinity. I'm sorry. T going to zero. Sorry, sorry. This is important. OK. OK, so this is what I expect in the sub phase. And uh, OK, so if I'm here, so I have some volume of solutions. This volume is shrinking to 0. So the entropy, S, is going to, be, is going to become minus infinite when I reach this line. Because since the volume is going to 0, the log of the volume is going to minus infinity. OK. So in order to compute this line, we will need to just to look at the point in which this entropy is going to minus infinity. OK. So this is what happens in the sub phase. Now let me consider the unsub phase. So in the unsub phase, so if I take the limit beta going to infinity, I will have a measure that is dominated by just the ground state of this H. OK? So if I look at F, this will just converge when the temperature goes to 0 to the energy, the intensive energy of the ground state of the cost function. Yes? What? M, this big M? Big M. Yes, this is integer. Uh, but then you scale it with N, and alpha can be whatever. So for N large, oh. alpha is a real number. Of course, if you want to simulate it, you need to take M integer. OK. OK. So everything is encoded in, in this free energy. 
So this is what we need to, to compute. Now, this free energy, again, is random because Z is random because H depends on quench disorder. So what we would like to do is to compute the typical free energy. So we would like to average this over the disorder. So in the answered phase, so this Z, so in the answered phase Z is e to the minus beta n the energy of the ground state, the in intensive energy. So if I just take the log and divide it by this, I just get this. Okay. So if I have access to this object, I can compute the properties of the volume of solution in the sat phase the properties of the ground state in the unsat phase, and I can compute even the critical point, the critical line. So the main problem is to compute this. And you see that we have the same problem as yesterday because we need to take the average of a log. And again, we will employ the replica method. Okay, so. All right, so, so we need to compute F. So we need to take the average over the set of random vector psi mu of log of Z. And so we will rewrite this as So this is the formula that we wrote yesterday. Are you OK with it? Do I need to explain? So I just use that log of x. I can rewrite it as the lim limit for n going to 0 of the de derivative with respect to small n of x to the n. OK? And x here is just there. OK, now, in principle, this is still hard, because if I take n to be some real number, I don't know how to compute this. But I know how to compute this if n is integer. And then I need to ask myself how to take this analytic continuation down, down to n equal to 0. But for the moment, let me consider n to be integer. So I can rewrite z to the n as an integral over a set of replicas of the original system, small n replicas. And each replica needs to be on its compact space, compact phase space. Okay. OK, now remember that H, OK, I'll write again the form of the Hamiltonian here. So H is, is what? It's a sum over mu of V of H mu. Here I should put H mu. So let me say that H mu is equal to R mu minus sigma. And I define R mu to be psi mu dot w over root n. So 
the Hamiltonian depends on W only through these combinations. So it's, it makes sense to define this variable and write the Hamiltonian this way. So what I can do now is the same trick as I did yesterday. So I will have now a set of R mu A because I will have a set of replicas W A. So what I can do here is just to introduce one. So I just integrate over R mu A of delta R mu A minus one over root 10 So I can introduce this inside this term and nothing changes. Is it OK? I hope so. And now what I do is exactly the same that, uh, as what I did yesterday. So I take the Fourier representation of this delta. And so I write. And here I should write OK, so I just consider the Fourier representation of the delta and introduce these variables r mu hat. So this is equal to 1. Eh? All this integral is equal to 1. And I can put it inside. OK? So what do I get? So I get now that this term I can rewrite as V of R mu A minus sigma. And then I have at the exponential this term. So now all the dependence on those random vectors is inside this term, R mu hat times this. So if I want to take the average over xi, the only term that I need to take into account is just this one. So that's where the vector xi mu enters in the game. So I need to take the average over xi of this. OK? OK, so since xi mu's are Gaussian random variables with zero million unit variance, you can take this average. It's, a just, it's just a Gaussian integral. OK, so this will be equal, apart from constant factors that I forget that are not important, this is equal to minus 1 over 2 divided by n, that is this square root squared. Then I have a sum over mu. So note that the, the average over each random vector is decoupled from the other ones. So I have a sum over mu here. And then I have a sum over a and b that go from 1 to n, small n. So this goes up to m of And then I have w a dot wb. OK, so as yesterday, you start to see that there is a new variable appearing that is 1 over n times this color product. And this is interesting because, so, Originally, when you take this expression, 
replicas are not interacting. So I can rewrite this integral as a product of integrals because that's where it comes from. But now when I average over the disorder, I start to get interaction between replicas. So I have different replicas of my original problem and they start to interact. But they start to interact through this matrix. which is what I call overlap matrix. And what's the physical meaning of this? So as yesterday, this is just the scalar product of these two vectors. Those, these two vectors are on the sphere. So the scalar product just tells you how much they are similar. So if this scalar product is one, they are, these two vectors are exactly the same. And then if they are orthogonal, then this means that they are on the equator of the sphere. So this overlap matrix gives you a measure of similarity between two different replicas of the system. And both replicas are subjected to the same disorder because they come from averaging uh, over xi. And the xi was the same for both of them. Okay, so a comment, so I know that QAA is equal to one by definition because those vectors are on the hypersphere and so if I take A equal to B, this is just the norm of, norm of the vector W divided by N which is one. So I know the diagonal of this matrix. All right, so now you see that all the dependence on W is inside this. So it makes sense again to make a change of variable and instead of integrating with respect to W, I can integrate with respect to Q. And the change of variable, the only thing that you need to do is to compute the Jacobian of the change of variable. And guess what? It's the same as yesterday. So this is exponential of n over 2. So if, if you have done the exercise of yesterday, you know the Jacobian. OK, so this expression can be rewritten in this way. So so this is equal to what? So I have an integral over this matrix Q. Note that the matrix is symmetric by definition. So I just need to integrate over the upper part of the matrix, upper triangular part. And then I have a term, an action, that I can write this way. So I have n times some action, big, big S, that depends on Q. And now let me write this. So this is what? So I have a Jacobian term. And then you see that I had these terms. But now these terms are factorized over the index mu. So different indices mu don't interact with each other. So as yesterday, so I used the trick that if I have something like this, So this is equal to the integral over the x of fx to the power m. And then I can rewrite this as exponential of m times the log of this integral. OK. So I can apply this trick 
to those terms. And so here I get a term that is alpha times the log of some local partition function, z, that in, I mean, if you do quantum, quantum systems, this is typically called the impurity problem, okay? But okay, it's just a local partition function, and what it is? So this is an integral, so I just need to put the green, the integral over these variables. Now I lost the index mu because it's absorbed in this term. Oops, sorry, just. And what do I have? I have so I have this term here that is precisely this one, and then I have this one. And here I just put QAB. So you have, in the end, you have an integral over this matrix of the exponential of some action that depends on this matrix, matrix in this way. So you have log that of Q, and then you have this integral that you have to do. And note that this integral, okay, sorry, I forgot a term, which is this one, which is important because otherwise the integral is Gaussian. But if I take a, a generic V, it cannot be Gaussian. OK. So I have this integral that I need to do. And this is a function of Q. So if I'm able to do this integral, I get some function of this matrix. And then I need to compute the integral over Q. Now I use again that I want to go in the larger limit. So this integral is dominated by a saddle point. And so I compute this integral over Q just by looking at the saddle point of S with respect to Q. OK. So for n going to infinity, I would like to find the solution of this equation. OK, so before looking at this equation, what I would like to do is to rewrite this integral. So this integral is, apart from this term, is a Gaussian integral over these two variables, r and r hat. And I claim that I can rewrite this integral in the following form. So yeah, so, so, and this is, okay, I left it as an exercise, but if you want, I can do the details. So I claim that if I have okay, let me write this way. So I, I use this trick. This is essentially diffusion equations. So I use this trick that if I want to do, to do this, so this is equal to a Gaussian integral. So 
So how many of you have seen this? You, good, at least one. Okay, so everybody knows. So this is just, I can use this trick in, in its multidimensional version, and I can rewrite this integral as the exponential of a differential operator. So this, so I claim that this z hat I can rewrite as Then I compute the derivatives for all h a equal to minus sigma. So you go from an integral to some differential operator. Okay. So this is for the moment just a trick. But then this you can compute we will see that this is very useful when we will make an ansatz over uh, this matrix Q. Okay. Okay, so we have made a lot of algebra, but then in the end, uh, this is nice because we have reduced our problem that was n-dimensional uh, and complicated to something which looks still a bit complicated, but it's not n-dimensional anymore. We can use a subtle point. And if we are able to solve these equations, we get our solution. So now the problem is how to solve these equations. Now, this problem is complicated. Why? It's complicated because if we fix the number of replicas, in principle, you, we could try to find a solution of these equations. But then we need to find some analytic continuation when the number of replicas goes to zero. And this, this is the source of all possible problems. So how to find a sensible solution in the n to zero limit? So the simplest thing is that you try some ansatz for the form of this matrix Q. So the simplest ansatz, that is what is called replica symmetric, corresponds to the following. So I can assume that my matrix Q, so this is Q, so it has to be one on the diagonal. This is because we have this spherical constraint on the variable the Ws. And then I can put some constant outside. Okay. So this means that if I look at two different replicas, whatever they are, they will be typically at the same overlap. So they are typically at the same distance. So, so it turns out that this ansatz is correct in the problem only in one region of the phase diagram. And in, in another region, and in particular close to the jamming point, you need to go beyond these ansatz and do something else. And so I will not do the, the, the slower thing of just do the computation with the replica symmetric ansatz. I will make a step and do directly a computation with a more complicated ansatz. That is what was found by Parisi in the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. And so let me describe the ansatz. So, so the same computation you can do for spin glasses. That was, that, this is what was done in the late 70s, beginning of the 80s for uh, for spin glasses. And there what was found is that this ansatz becomes 
uh, wrong at low temperature. And so what Parisi uh, was able to do is to um, change the form of this matrix in order to have some meaningful solution at zero temperature. So how the nuance uh, looks like. So what you can do is that you can parameter parameterize the matrix in this way. So how he came up with these ansatz, I don't know. But uh, So you, in the end, the problem is that you need to parameterize a matrix that is 0 times 0. Because when n goes to 0, you, you have a matrix of dimension 0 times 0. So, so how do you do? So what he proposed is that you take this matrix. So again, you have 1 on the diagonal. This is the only thing that you are sure about. And then you do the following trick. It's not a trick, it's an ansatz. So you parameterize the matrix in the following way. So here you put some Q0. Now you take diagonal blocks of some sides. Let me say that you have M0 here, M0. And then those internal blocks can get, can have the same construction that you have done here over and over again. So you can have that this thing, and then each of these blocks can undergo the same construction. Now, of course, this you can do only for some sets of values of m0 and small n and so on. But then you will have to take the n to 0 limit. So all the constraints that you have on this I don't know how to say, the fact that uh, each block needs to fit the others, in the end, you, you don't get when you consider n to 0. So a way to parameterize this matrix is that you, you do the following. So, so you start from, so how do you parameterize this matrix? So this is. You have a set of the values of Q. So you have Q0 here, Q1 here, Q2 here, yes, and so on. Is it OK? OK. So you have all those values, Q0, Q1, QK. And K is the level of way the number of times you break this diagonal structure. And then you have another set of numbers that is the size of these blocks. OK. Yes, so and these numbers you need to find. Okay. So what you would like to do is to take these ansatz, put inside this form of the action. Ah, you just take the form of the shape of the The action. shape is fixed. Oh. And then I take the variational equation only on the parameters. So I just reduce the space of all possible matrices to this space. Okay. okay. Sorry? Yeah, so it has some ultrametric structure that I will discuss maybe a bit. So here you have those numbers, and then you have the sides of the matrix. Then you have M M0. OK, maybe M1. Now I will make a mess with the notation. Let me just try to check. So I do MK and K minus 1. And then I have N here. OK. Now, in principle, so if I have this matrix, I have n that is bigger than, I don't know, m1, which is bigger than m2, that is bigger than mk. But then I need to take n to 0. And so I don't know why, but so what you can do is that since n is going to 0, you can reverse everything. So when, when n goes to 0, 
you say that n becomes smaller than m1, because it is smaller than m2, it is smaller to m than mk. So why is that? So let me just give you a pictorial view of this. OK, what do I erase this? So so this is n So in principle I have something like this so I have um Am I doing a mistake here? So now we'll make a mistake. Um, so let me say that I have one over n. But no, then I'm wrong. So OK, let me write this way. So in principle, I have something like this. So this is n. And this is 1. And then I have the first block, which is below. But then by continuity, I get something like this. So this is n, this is m1. This is M2. Because when I cross 1, I need to reverse everything, I mean, just by, by continuity. So if I had some orientation here, as soon as I cross n equal to 1, everything is reversed. Yes. What is I, the x and, and y axis? OK, what is the, in the x and y? Yes. It's, uh, Let me say that it's n. So in principle, this is a straight line. OK, this should be a straight line going up to 0. OK, so I just plot n. OK, and then I plot the m's. Does it, this make sense? I, don't, I think it doesn't make sense, because to me it still doesn't make sense. But, but if I look at. Sorry? What's the virtual? N. <laughs> so I'm just plotting N and N. <laughs> OK? So, OK, so no, the, the vertical axis you, you plot, uh, I mean, it, it depends which curve you are looking at. It's M as a function of N. OK, but how do you come up with these curves? How do you come up with these curves? Because you imagine that you solve your variational problem for N bigger than 1. Okay. And then there it makes sense that you have this orientation. And then you try to look at what happens when n is going to 0. And you try to take the analytic continuation of those curves. Okay, okay, okay. And then this makes sense that if nothing goes wrong around 1, all the orientation reverse. Okay. So you're saying that the, 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 the convexity just appears naturally when you solve this for n greater than 1? Yeah, but I don't, I don't think that anybody has solved this for n, uh, had done this experiment, really. I'm, I'm, I don't know. So, but this is the intuition. Well, actually, this is much more incredible, even the, 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 the shape of you. Then everything else is okay. <laughs> so, so, once you have this, you can parameterize this. So, you can say, okay, let me write. So, let me write something between. So. I can put all those order parameters here inside the function. So which goes from 0 to 1. And, um, it goes from small n to 1. So x here is an index that has to take 
values that are uh, these m's. So you have n, m1, m2, and then here I will make for sure a mistake. Skip the notation. And one that I call mk, which is the, really the innermost block. OK, so these are the, the sides of the, of the squares. And then for each side, I have some value, OK? Now, why I'm doing something which is strictly increasing will become clear uh, in a while. But then you, when, you should, when you see this, these are the values of Q. So this is Q0, this is Q1, blah, blah, blah. And now what you do is that you imagine that you take this construction infinite amount of time. So you have squares inside squares inside squares and so on. So all these things become very close to each other. And so this curve becomes something which is continuous. So you go from a matrix of sides 0 times z 0 to a order parameter, which is a function. So the space of matrices that are 0 times 0 is a functional space. So this is black. To me, it looks like black magic. Uh, but the fact that this is correct for uh, spin glasses, it was proven. So people really struggled a lot to show that this construction is correct. And for spin glasses, now we know that it's correct. So it gives you the right free energy, it gives you the ground state, and it gives you also a way to construct algorithms to find uh, configurations that are very close to the ground state. Why, why the maximum value the MK, MK is equal to 1? Because I can always do this. So I can just okay. re re scale thing. Yes. OK, so yes. Yes, so. OK, so for the moment, I'm not discussing the phase diagram. I'm just saying, OK, I take the most general answers I can take with this form. And then if I have some replica symmetric phase in which the matrix has just one and something which is homogeneous at sight, I should see that this function, when I take the saddle point, becomes a constant. OK, so the replica symmetric phase is encoded in this. So that's why. So typically, I mean, I should go slowly and do the replica symmetric thing, which, uh, and here I'm just doing everything at the same time. Hopefully, uh, I hope that it's not, uh, it's okay. Yes. I will tell you why. Yes, x is a continuous variable that represents how m, I mean, it's the evolution of m. Okay. Yeah, actually, x will become the cumulative distribution of the overlap of these queues. OK, I will, I will two minutes and then I'm, I'm there. Yes. No. So, if you do some finite k, uh, you need to, so you plug these ansatz inside the, the action. Then you solve those equations. And those equations become equations for the values of these queues and these numbers. So in principle, they can change. OK, so what's the physical meaning of all this? Because for the moment, it's really 
some weird thing. So the simplest thing that you can do is to look at the probability distribution of the overlap between two replicas. So imagine that I take my problem, my original problem, and I say, OK, I extract some configuration w, let's say w1, with the Gibbs measure. So this Gibbs measure has a set of random vectors. Now I extract another configuration, w2, with the same measure. OK, so the set of random vectors that I plug inside the Hamiltonian is exactly the same. So I'm just extracting two configurations. And then what I can ask myself is what is the overlap between these two? So this question is well posed, right? It, it is telling me if I extract two configurations, how far away they are. So in particular, if I am in the SAT phase, just to come back to the original problem, so, so this will tell me what is the typical size of the blob in which I have the, in which I have the solutions. So here in the SAT phase, those two will be two solutions of my problem. And this thing will tell me how close they will be. And in particular, if I go close to jamming, I expect that this thing will go to one. No? Just because at jamming, I have just one solution that is left. So these two will be the same. And if they, they will be the same, Q will go to one. But now this is something that is, I mean, if I, extract two solutions, this will give me a value, but then I can make the histogram of this. So I can look at the probability distribution of this, of this thing. So how do I do? So the probability distribution of the overlap is what? It's, and, and then I, so in principle, this is something that depends on psi. OK, and now we'll consider what is the average probability distribution of the overlap, which is the average over psi of 1 over z square, where this is the partition function. Then I have an integral over w1, w2, e to the minus beta h w1 times e to the minus beta h w2. And then I have some delta function of q minus, so nq minus w1 dot w2. OK. Now, you can use the, the, the replica method again to compute this. How do you do? Well, you have just 1 over z square, but I can rewrite this as z n minus 2 and take the limit n to 0. So for n to 0, this is 1 over z square. But then look at how many w's do I have. I have two w's here, two replicas here, and here I have n minus 2 replicas. So totally I have small n replicas. So I do again all the same business, and I compute the same thing, and I get exactly the same action. And all this thing, you can show, so it's just a, we do the same computation, that is equal to what? It's equal to the limit of 1 over n, n minus 1 of sum over a different than b. So if you compute the saddle point solution for the matrix Q, then P of Q is just given by this. OK. OK, so this is a formula. 
And then what, I, what you have to do is just to plug inside this QAB the ansatz there. Now there is some algebra. And yes. So and what you can show is that this So when you take this continuum limit, you can show that this thing becomes okay, now I'm, I'm a bit abusing of notation. So let me call this Q at just to make a small difference with Q of X. So, okay, so it seems, so the way in which you have to do this is that you go, you take the K appro KRSB approximation where you have K terms, and then you assume that M1, M MI minus MI uh, minus one is the X, is small, okay? And if you do this, you can, go from this to this integral. And now this is just dx of q divided by q, where x of q is just the inverse function of q of x. So if I just, this is q of x, I can look at the inverse function, which is x of q. And so if I take the derivative, I just get the probability distribution that if I extract two configurations with the Gibbs measure, there will be at an overlap Q. So in this function, so this function tells you how the landscape of solution is organized. So I can have, for example, that two solutions are very close, but then I have a full hierarchy of distances, possible distances between solutions. And those distances to each one is associated a probability distribution, okay? So the function x, if I integrate this over q, gives me just the cumulative distribution of the overlap. Okay. So how much time do I have? It's over. 10 minutes, okay. Okay, so. Okay, so let me just give another. Uh, okay, so what do I do? Okay. Okay, so the last thing that I would like to do uh, is to. Um, tell you how we can use this structure to have an equation for this term. So this will be a bit technical, but I, can, I think I can do it uh, in 10 minutes. So, okay, what do I do? I erase. Yeah, sorry, computer Q hat. Sorry, you're right. Okay, so so in the end, this construction gives you access to the structure of sol how the solutions of the constraint satisfaction problem are organized in phase space. In particular, what are their typical distances? So, okay, this I can. Okay, this I will not remove because I need. To. So now I would like to plug these answers inside this. And then I will use a lot this equation. Okay. So how do I do? 
OK, so I will follow a strategy that was uh, proposed by Duplantier in the 80s. I don't remember which year, I'm sorry. So, so I can rewrite this matrix that has this block structure in the following form. So the matrix Q can be rewritten as 1 minus QK and 0 outside plus here this block is full. There is no diagonal uh, now. And here I write QK minus QK minus 1. and zero outside. And then I add all the other blocks. So I repeat the construction. So I take bigger blocks. And so here I will have QK minus 1 minus QK minus 2, zero outside, and so on. So when you add this to this, for example, you just get that this QK is canceled. So you have the diagonal, which is equal to 1. And the same for all the blocks outside. Now, why this is interesting? Because let me consider this matrix, plug it into, the, into this differential operator. So this is a diagonal term, which is applied to something that is factorized. OK. So So I have exponential of 1 half, 1 minus QK, so this is just one of the elements of this diagonal applied to one of these factors e to the minus beta v, okay? So I have just this. So this I know that is a Gaussian integral using this formula. One minus Q. Okay. So let me call this function G. And I will call it g of x equal to 1, because it's really the innermost block of those matrices. And it's a function of h. OK, it's a function of h. Now I move away from the innermost block, and I consider this one. So what I have to do? So I have to consider this. Oops. And then here I have that, so when I look at this block, this block is acting on mk minus 1 of those terms. So I will have here g of 1 and h to the power m k minus 1. OK, so this will give me, so the first term is this term applied to one factor. And then I have those blocks. And each one has sides m k minus 1. OK, so it will act on mk minus 1 of this innermost term. And then I need to apply this differential operator. So this is what I define as g of mk minus 1 
and h. So again, now, you see that this is a Gaussian integral. I can rewrite it this way, but now the kernel is this one. And this is applied to some function that I need to compute. And then I can go on, and I have some g of mi minus 1 and h. That will be the exponential of, now I don't have to make a mess. So this is to the power m i minus 1 divided by m i. You remember that here we had this to the power m k minus 1. But actually, this is m k minus 1 divided by m k. But m k is equal to 1 with my definition. So in general, when I'm exploring further away this matrix from the diagonal, I need to rescale with the, uh, the innermost block. Okay, so I have this recursion relation that tells me what is this function at the level mi minus one given the function at the level mi. And then I would, I would like to compute this when this m is going to small n that is going to zero. This will be the value of this object at the end of the computation. So why this is interesting? Because now I can say, look, but now I can take a continuum limit. So this is q dot of x times dx, and m i minus 1, now I need to do, is equal to m i minus dx. And m i, I say that it's x. It's a running variable. And then I, I can expand in the x. OK. Let me do it. So I can erase this part here and that just work the expansion of the, this expression. And then I'm done. So, so if I look at this, what do I get? I get that this, this term here, I can rewrite it as 1 plus 1 half q dot of x, where here with q dot, I just denote the derivative with respect to x of this function. Uh, yes. And then he, and here, what do I have? I have g of x and h to the power 1 minus dx over x. OK, you just use this inside this, and you get this. And then the right hand side, OK, so let me just develop again this. So this is, for the x very small, it's what? It's g of x and h plus q dot over 2 dx. And then you have g second, where by this I mean the derivative with respect to h. So this is the second derivative of g with respect to h. And then I have minus dx over x g log g. OK, I'm just developing this expression at the first order in the x. And then this thing I can develop 
developed very easy. So this will be G of X and H minus dx dg over dx. OK. So you have this that must be equal to this. And so you have a, an equation for the flow of this function g when I change x. So what is this equation? So you get that so you get g dot and then indicate with the dot derivative with respect to x is equal to q dot over 2 of g second of x and h minus g of x and h divided by x log g of x and h. And this is, this is a partial differential equation with a boundary condition at x equal to 1, which is the condition that I wrote before. So it's the integral over dz. the value of q of x in 1 at x equal to 1 okay so if you want to have the expression of the of this exponential of the differential operator you just need to solve this equation it's a partial differential equation with some boundary at x equal to 1 and it, you need to solve it backward in time, where I call time this variable x. Now, there is a simpler form of this equation, which you get just by saying that g of x and h, you can rewrite it as e to the x, f of x and h. And so if you do that, you plug this into this, and you get the, the following. You get f dot Sorry, I, I forgot a minus sign here. I'm sorry. And here it's plus. So you get this flow equation, and the initial condition is just that since g of 1 and h is e to the 1 times f of 1 and h, f of 1 and h is just the log of this thing, which looks like a free energy of some partition function in one dimension. thing for the moment has, has brought us to, in order to compute uh, the free energy of the, of the original partition function, we need to compute the solution of this equation. So we have a partial differential equation, and this partial differential equation depends on Q. So for the moment, this is not a saddle point equation. This is just a, an equation that you need to compute to solve in order to compute your action as a function of this function order parameter, this q of x. So what I will do tomorrow is to tell you what are the saddle point equation for this function q of x, and then I will tell you that these saddle point equations with these PDEs 
will give rise to a scaling regime when I reach the jamming transition. And this scaling regime will have scaling function, the same kind of the one that Jim is, is discussing. And those scaling functions have inside the critical exponents of the transition. Okay, so this equation was first derived by Parisi in the context of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model. So it has a nice structure, it has an Hamilton, Jacobi, Bellman structure in the sense that you see that it's a PDE that needs to go backward in time. So you start from x equal to one and you need to go to x equal to zero. And backward equations in time are typically equations that arise in optimal control problems that I don't know if you know. So optimal control problems are problems in which you have like, you want to set, for example, a rocket to the moon. So the rocket needs to go in some random environment. So you need to adjust the trajectory in order to compensate with the random fluctuations. So you have some control variables that you need to tune to minimize some cost. And so this is the principle of dynamic programming and the, the, way, which, the way in which you construct the optimal uh, control policy is given through a Bellman equation. And this equation has some kind of, this has this structure. And it's not uh, by chance that you have this because you can show that there is an optimal control problem arising in this problem. But okay, this is maybe too much. Okay, so we will start from this, and then I will tell you what are the result, the, the last equations, maybe without the derivation. And then I would like to exhibit the scaling solution of those equations. And now we can get the, the exponents of the giant transition. Yes. Sorry, I didn't get. If you have uh, any reason, mathematical reason, or physical reason, for not expecting uh, such a form of automatization, like the, the date flash as an open quotation, we will use to be much more easier to go in the same number. How is this calculation? How is this calculation? It's very rude. It's an uh, artifact, yeah? Yeah, it seems artifact, right? It's yes. Uh, but. Um, So, no, I think that, so the best answer to your question is that, so, I mean, the way in which this was got by Parisi, I don't know, but, but after 30 years, now we know that in this structure, there is the full structure of metastable states or pure states of the Gibbs measure of the original problem. So I have a Gibbs measure. So this Gibbs measure can have many pure states. What is a pure state? You can think about a ferromagnet. So below the critical temperature, you have two pure states. So the, the ferromagnet is magnetized all plus or all minus, depending on the boundary condition. So if I just put an epsilon boundary condition, I can get my ferromagnet all down or all plus. So the Gibbs measure below the critical temperature has two pure states. Here you can have exponentially many pure states. And this structure for the matrix Q tells you how those pure states are organized between themselves. So originally it was just some black magic, but then it's very physical. And actually it's so physical that if you have this, you can even design algorithms to find the ground state of your problem. So you have a high-dimensional problem, high-dimensional optimization problem. The landscape is very bumpy. And you can use the knowledge of the fact that the ground state has this structure to design algorithms that finds this ground state. This is something that was done recently by Montanari. Let, let, let me. Uh, we, we're a little bit yes, hard pressed sorry. for time, so let's thank him there. <laughs> and it,